the flag. I don't know if we have any veterans, but if you are a veteran, feel free to salute. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Sorry, of course we have a veteran. veteran. My thing. <laughs> oh, so can we have the roll call? Here. 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 Yes. Yes. And it looks like we have a special presentation today. Always exciting to hear about our teens. So Borchard Community Center, please. And, and please be sure that you, um, please be sure that whoever is speaking is in the microphone. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Cusworth, members of the board, administration, and community. My name is Michael Braff. I am the recreation coordinator at the Borchard Community Center. I have with me Luis Cano, who is the recreation specialist at the Borchard Community Center, who oversees the Borchard Community Center Teen Volunteer Program. The Borchard Teen Volunteer Program has been a staple of the Caneo Recreation and Park District over the past 20 years. Current supervisors, coordinators, as well as other full-time and part-time staff have come up through the teen volunteer program. Without the Borchard Teen Volunteer Program, the programs, classes, and special events that we offer to our community would not be as memorable or as fulfilling. Here's what the Borchard Center Teen Volunteer Program is all about. Towards the end of April and beginning of May, we begin by sending out emails and updated applications to our previous and current volunteers, reminding them of the upcoming summer program. We also send out applications to the local middle schools and Newbury Park High School to get the word out for potential new volunteers. On the application, we indicate a deadline to prevent an influx of applications because in previous years, we've had an average, on average of over 40 applications come in where we've had to set a cap on applicants. Once the deadline passes, we decide in a couple of days over a two week period where we schedule interview times. These volunteer interviews are as basic as possible. Based on their interview availability and interest, we come up with a schedule for each volunteer. We make it like a job posting and an interview process. Then comes the volunteer orientation and ice cream social, which is usually one afternoon before, during the week before our summer classes start. At the orientation, our staff will go over the entire program including staff and volunteer introductions, schedules, do's and don'ts with the kids, and a tour of our facility. Also, expectations throughout the day and more. This is also a time where we go over any last minute questions. Then comes day one of our volunteer program and summer classes. Volunteers come in prior to their start time to help with, assist with any setup and prep for crafts for the day and stay after to help with cleanup. During program time, volunteers assist in organizing games, crafts, activities, science experiments, and much more with the kids. If volunteers are scheduled in the office, they may answer phones, help direct patrons, help prep crafts uh, for other programs, and help with office and computer work. Throughout the summer, we also try and go the extra mile for our volunteers since they do the same for our programs and classes. This past summer, we held a resume and interview workshop to help them get, get them ready for the time when they apply for their first job. The workshop went over how-tos, tips, do's and don'ts, samples, hard soft skills, and preparations for on cover letters, resumes, and interviews. Appreciation and motivation are huge factors in keeping teen volunteers going. This past summer, we did a mid-summer pool party at Newbury Park High School, where we barbecued, played music, and had a great time. At the end of summer, we had a laser tag and video game party, we blacked out the windows of the Borchard Gym. To make it as dark as possible, we had games on wheels come by and set up laser tag in the gym. And they brought their trailer where video games for all current systems were available for play. The volunteers would play a game of laser tag. They would go play Madden and then go have pizza. At the end of summer, we give a volunteer a signed letter stating and certifying how many hours they volunteered with us and what the time of their service was spent doing. We also do a can we contact you throughout the year list to gauge interest 
about during the school year volunteer opportunities, including special events, winter break camps, spring break camps, afternoon classes, and weekend classes. So what is the value of the teen volunteer program? First, it strengthens the, their sense of community. They are provided a sense of belonging, bonding, and membership. This sense of membership also provides a sense of security because community members develop ways of understanding who is part of their community. It develops responsibility with the teens. This is the teen's first taste of a job environment in an easy and fun way. While playing and interacting with the kids, they learn dependability, they begin to learn and acquire new sets of skills, they learn how to honor commitments, they gain confidence, and they learn about social and self-awareness. It is a feeder program for staff. As stated earlier, a handful of our current employees have come through the teen volunteer program. You could easily say that this program is the future of CRPD staff. <laughs> this past summer, 2022, we had a total of 28 teen volunteers who volunteered a total of 1,763 and a half total hours. If you're comparing it to a recreation aide who currently makes $15 per hour, these hours equivalent to $26,452.50. As you can see, the Board Your Teen Volunteer Program is crucial to the quality of the center as well as Conecuh Recreation and Park District. Here's a video of the program, as well as current CRPD employees who are once boarded volunteers. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Very nice. All right. I would like to present our volunteer of the year, Izzy Cipriano. Izzy is currently a freshman, freshman in Newry Park High School. Izzy has played a crucial role in our volunteer program for over five years. She started volunteering with Miss Tia's classes and then made her way into classes, camps, and special events. For summer 2022, Izzy's volunteered a total of 119 hours. 
no matter what program, class, or event we had going on, you can always find her helping us out with a smile on her face. Thank you, Izzy, for your dedication, commitment, and hard work. Good evening, my name is Isabel Cipriano. I started volunteering at the Borchard Community Center in 2017. The volunteer program is amazing and teaches teens useful skills such as communication, teamwork, and responsibility. The program also gives teens a chance to give back to our community. Personally, the volunteer program has helped me grow into what I am today. Thank you. We wanna thank you for the opportunity to present our Borchard Center volunteer program, and we are available for any questions or comments you may have. Yes, Director Lang. Thank you, and thank you for a great presentation and including us in the presentation for Izzy. It's spectacular. And I'm very glad we added that last feature of who went through the program and where they are now within the CRPD program. Um, so important. It just kind of tells the story of who you guys are, who you, you know, that are getting involved with CRPD. And it's a great uh, feeling to see all the people like you. One question in reference to, I'm not sure of all the age groups that you deal with, but when you interview people and go through that process, uh, how do you determine what grade level of, of the group that individuals will work with. Um, Thank you. Uh, so in those interviews, we kind of will ask them what their interests are, what age group they like working with, what their availability is. And we kind of take all of that into consideration and maybe also some of their experience as well as what age group they might have siblings that are, you know, four. So they might enjoy working with four-year-olds or they might have, you know, some older, younger siblings that are in their, you know, six to nine-year-old range. So we really leave it up to them, as well as availability and interest. Yeah. Very important how they relate, obviously, and the fact that you have a method of determining, you know, a lot of things go into that decision, but that's, that's important because, you know, you certainly don't want to assign somebody to a group that they would rather not be with, so. Good programs and good work on your part. Thank you very much for being part of CRPD. Thank you. Director Huffer. Yeah, I want to add my thanks for the presentation. I, I, I know that I was somewhat aware that this this program existed, but best of my recollection was the first time we had a presentation about this, and to hear the details and what the staff and more importantly what the volunteers are doing is is really. Uh, great information, so I do appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> this uh, program is just for summer months? Uh, no, it, it's year-round. Our biggest in, uh, group of volunteers is over summer, but throughout the year, we'll have you know things coming up with like spring break camps, winter break camps, our special events. We're going to have volunteers coming up in October for the Hall of on the Trail. So, um, you know, when the kids are out of school, that's when they come over a lot to Borchard, but throughout the year, you know, on weekends, we'll have occasional some volunteers, but summers are big time for, for, for volunteers. Okay, because I, my recollection, I don't know if it's still in existence or not, but my, my recollection was that most of the uh, local high schools um, either require or give some kind of extra credit for teenagers who are involved in, in volunteer programs of one sort or another. So hopefully a program like this, um, they're able to get some credit for that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And um, you answered my question about the, the number of people and the, the total hours and, and the value of those hours is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, and the, the listing of all of the folks who started out on the volunteer program and now work part or full time for the district, um, Including that's where you got your start, huh, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. Pretty neat. So anyway, thank you very much for the information and the presentation from all three of you. Thank you. Director Nichols. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I had no idea the, the breadth and width of the program. That's awesome. I have a couple of questions. Is this replicated at any other community center? Um, I believe some of the, it's kind of up to each center on how they do their volunteer program. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if they are doing as extensive, but I think that they are doing some form of a volunteer program. Is this one of your secrets of success, which makes Borchard one of the most mm -hmm. popularly used centers? Oh, awesome, awesome. I won't tell anybody about that then. Uh, and of the volunteers that you come, they, they come to their express interest. How many of them are from our local area within the region, within the district, and how many are from outside that, just within the general region? Just ballpark, maybe. I would say pretty much everybody. Is, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And then lastly, what is your total number of full-time and part-time staff at the center? Uh, at just at Borchard? It's Borchard, it's yes. Full-time staff, me and for gunning, and then part-time, uh, I want to say about maybe between 10 and 15, about, with, yeah, so 10 to 15 part-time, and then me and for full-time. And so it's probably fair to say that you couldn't do what you do without the volunteers. Correct. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you for the presentation. Lizzie, uh, excuse me, Lizzie, thank you for representing our volunteers tonight. And uh, thank you personally for your contribution and making our community as a whole what it is. So thank you. Uh, Mrs. Callis, can you tell us a little bit about the other centers volunteers? Sure. Yeah. All of the centers use volunteers throughout the um, throughout the session, throughout the year. So kids can volunteer anywhere. Um, they have volunteer applications and, and they can use them in the different programs and for special events. But Borchard is the only one that I'm aware of that actually has in the summer, this program that includes like resume building and orientation training and interviewing and stuff to that effect. So, but yeah, volunteers can be everywhere, but they've got a specific program. Thank you. I was kind of wondering that I was going to ask that myself because I didn't remember having a program such as this from the other centers. Yeah. So director Holt. Well, I kind of agree with what the other board members have said, um, and I've been very aware of uh, Borchard, and I've been there a few times, and, and I mean, it's well-staffed, and there's a lot going on, and it's very impressive, so um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just curious about how many applications do you get that you can't... Uh accommodate or do most of the kids are you able to accommodate most of the applications i mean we have a cutoff so we usually try to cut it off about like between 25 and 30 but we've had times where we've gone 40 50 applications and, oh really you know if we if we accept every application that we get in i mean our classes are going to have the same amount of kids as volunteers mm -hmm. yeah i was just wondering yeah, if you yeah. were getting like double the <laughs> amount of volunteers yeah we've so. had to turn you know you know turn some away but we also We'll say like, you know, check with those Antos Community Center, check with Alex Oaks Community Center. Um, so we do offer them other options. Well, it's really nice to know that you're doing this. So all the people that you listed that got their start, were they all volunteers at Borchard Community Center? Oh, that's really impressive. Um, well, I wanna personally thank you because my granddaughter um, attended uh, camp at Borchard Community Center and had such a good time. My daughter signed up for a second week. So I'm sure that she met a lot of your volunteers. So oh, I know you're doing a fabulous job just from a personal level. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for coming. It was very enlightening. Sure. Uh, okay, Director Lang again. Real quick. Um, now, the three of you most likely are in Mary Park High School. And we're at the Great Park High School. And do you do some personal recruiting, other fellow class members, or people they would enjoy fitting well with the portrait uh, staff and volunteer program? I graduated, you know, in 2008, <laughs> so uh, not currently. Yes, so for some of like the special events, I'll recommend to some of my friends because we do in fact need community service hours for some like 
classes and things like that. So yes, sometimes I will um, recommend my friends, hey, there's this really cool event going on. You should come and volunteer. And if you like it, then there's a summer program as well. Best type of recommendation Thank you so much. Yeah, just uh, sounds like you've got a model program there. It's a win win for everybody. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. These kind of things make me really proud to even be here. Um, do we have any items from the public? No? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we have an approval of the agenda? So moved. Thank second. you. A second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Uh, for our consent calendar, we do have a resolution on this, but it was um, a minor. We've already approved this resolution, so we're not going to go through that. And then we also have the Board of Directors meeting schedule that I'm sure that for 2023 that I'm sure that we all looked at. Are there any questions on the consent calendar? No, do I have a motion to approve? Uh, I'll Director move to approve Nichols. the uh, consent calendar. Do we have a second on that? I'll second that. Thank you, Director Lang. All, all um, in favor? Aye. 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 Fabulous, moving on. Um, do we have any deferred matters that we are talking about today? No. Okay, thank you. Any items for discussion at this time? Nope. All right, let's move on to new items. And okay, thank you. So we'll do 9A, adopt a resolution, and this will be uh, Mr. Friedel. Yes, thank you, Chair Cussworth and members of the board. And I think staff is going to be allowing um, one of the callers online into our Zoom meeting, or at least she should have access now. So I'm going to introduce to you, as I kick off this item, um, the consultant who worked very hard on this for the uh, entire county, but in also with us for the CRPD portion of this uh, hazard, uh, this multi Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan. So um, Megan Brotherton should be joining us here online and she'll be a consultant available for questions. Um, she works for Tetra Tech and uh, she's been doing um, this kind of work for many years and it's got a, you know, upwards of 25 different multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plans under her belt. And their company is currently working on the entire hazard mitigation plan for the state of California. So, um, and then I always ask people that I'm kind of meeting for the first time, what's their favorite recreational activity? So she is a mountain biker and mm -hmm. road biker. She loves anything on a bike. So that's her thing. Hey, welcome, Megan. I don't know if you heard any of that, but I introduced you. <laughs> I, I heard a bit of it. Thank you. Everything you said was true. <laughs> so, And thank you very much for inviting me to your board meeting this evening. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about hazard mitigation and answer any of your questions. Um, so if you don't mind, Megan, I'll just do a very, very brief um, overview of what, what happened. And then, of course, you lived it for couple of years so you can kind of expand on anything I, I say incorrectly, which uh, could be a lot, but we'll see here. So um, the Canoe Rec and Park District does a variety of things when it comes to sort of emergency preparedness. And so we participate with the city of Thousand Oaks and their emer emergency operations plan. Um, we have a component in that. Um, we have CRP's own disaster management plan, which we approved in May of 2020. We have worked with the county and human services agency on a mass care and shelter plan. So we've got that pretty current in October of 21. And we keep handy, which I'm really sad to report a mass shooting playbook, which is uh, a document on how to manage a, a shooting scenario. So um, those are kind of our background, you know, risk management and, you know, hazard natural disaster preparedness items that we have. Um, but this is something that is at the county level and it is they've been 
gathering more and more agencies over the years. They've done this a few times now, a few cycles, if you will, and um, they're gathering more agencies as, as they go. And this is CRPD's first time uh, being part of the countywide um, has a multi-agency, you know, hazard mitigation plan. So really mitigation, when you want to think about it, is what sustained actions can we take to reduce or eliminate long-term risk to life and property from a hazard event? So that's kind of what this document is put together for. Um, go right to a punchline. One of the most important uh, reasons from, you know, how do we keep functioning and operating is obviously we want to reduce risk and be safer and uh, forecast and predict and plan for sort of bad events that will occasionally ar arise. But um, in order to get help from the federal and state government and specifically get grant funding both before and after, you need to have a certain amount of planning documents done. And that's a lot easier if you've done it beforehand and with others. So that's my understanding of our park analyst, um, Bill Palermo, was very instrumental in working with the team. And um, this is his fine work product and working with um, Megan and her team. So with that, I'm available for questions. Megan, please, now, if you'd like to add anything or help with anything, but I'm sure the board might have a few questions as well. Thank you. Yes, you did a great overview. and. In a nutshell, really, the, the point of preparing these plans is for pre-disaster mitigation funding opportunities. Uh, FEMA has a huge pot of grant funding available for pre-disaster, and it, it's essential for jurisdictions to have a hazard mitigation plan in place before they can apply for that pre-disaster funding. So that's Typically, the only reason jurisdictions do a hazard mitigation plan is for funding opportunities. But really, it's it's an excellent model to look at hazards that could impact the area and try to prevent those impacts. So mitigation is very different than response. We're used to seeing response actions. That's where everybody rallies together and responds to something that, that's had serious consequences on a community. But by doing mitigation projects, it really lessens that need. And, and that's what we're looking for is lessening that need of response, freeing up resources so money and staff can be spent doing other things that are that are more fun, like the presentation that we just we just listened to with all of your volunteers. That, that was fantastic. So um, so yeah, so mitigation is is a very valuable part of planning. And we're really glad that CRPD joined in the county plan this time. It's a five-year five year plan. And so this update, I believe that, I believe the district has seven mitigation actions that are fundable by different means. But yes, I'd be happy to answer any questions if, if anyone would like to ask. Are there any questions? Director Le Director Nichols, All right. please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim, and also Megan for the review. Appreciate that. Uh, I notice you've got quite the collection of agencies involved with this uh, district, special districts. Uh, there are some that are not there. I presume this is a voluntary process where, where the, the agencies can choose to participate. Is there any level of coercion to try and get as many as you possibly can, or is there value that, or is it just a matter of coordination? So it is a matter of coordination. And this was actually done before Tetra Tech was hired as a consultant. So this was done by the county um, before we came on board. And part of it was outreach to those jurisdictions that participated in the previous planning period, as well as some, there was outreach to some that, that had not participated, which is the case with your district. So there was a new city this time around that did not participate in the previous plan, and that was uh, the city of Simi Valley. And then a number of the district planning partners were new this time around, and it is voluntary. It's not, it's not required. Uh, nobody can twist your arm, <laughs> but it is really beneficial because it opens up an opportunity for grant funding that, that it's not available without the plan. So that's really 
that's really the the point. And dollars talk, <laughs> so that that's why a lot of jurisdictions have decided to participate. Well, that certainly would be a, a reason to uh, want to participate. Uh, and then aside from that, with the coordination effort, when you because I see we've got a you know shopping list as you mentioned some some action items so to speak, uh, and I presume each agency gets there. So. Where does that coordination come in? If it's a matter of this countywide effort to try and pull this together so that everyone can you know, get a, a shot of whatever funding might be available, where does the value come into the coordinating activities between agencies once this is said and done? So it's very valuable. FEMA actually gives priority to grant funding when there's uh, interagency or interjurisdiction collaboration. So you do have an opportunity to collaborate, of course, with the city, because you're you're right there. Um, but then also within the county itself, there are opportunities to collaborate on projects. And when, when grant applications are being written and um, grants are being pursued, when agencies can coordinate, it does help kind of lighten the load of grant writing, which can be, which can be cumbersome. And also it just brings a broader perspective to grant opportunities that are region-wide or take in a couple of different jurisdictions. Uh, it, it benefits everyone. Well, good. I, I would hope it minimizes paperwork too, because the FEMA paperwork <laughs> process can be quite burdensome. So if you can do it once instead of uh, 27 times or however many agencies, that's a benefit to itself. So thank yeah. you very much for the presentation and uh, answering my questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, and uh, Director Lang. Yes, um, Director Nichols, of course, in every one of mine. And uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, it doesn't seem like participant consistent. Uh, but on page uh, 74, talking about the various added, 64, uh, did you say? Yes, it's not on you. Drought. What, what's going to happen? In, in the rest of the drought, what could happen? Maybe have a drought. So, um, pardon? Yeah. Um, the other thing, what do you do with drought? Until Saturday. Am I going okay? Yeah. Uh, can you can you hear um, yeah. Press the, the speaker? I, I cannot. If you're speaking, if you're asking me a question, I, I could not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so let, okay, let's, uh, I'm going to turn off my mic. Yours? Try it again, please. Testing, testing. Yeah, Yours was on. Be, Mine's on. Should I turn it off? You want to use Chuck's real quick? Yeah, you got to use Chuck's. Yours is Chuck's not working. Okay. Oh, man. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Megan. We had a broken I mic. So I paid okay. so much for that mic, we, too. We, uh, we're, we're moving into emergency reactionary mode here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you need to mitigate that hazard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I can um, hear you now. Thank you. Just curious, you know, this second item on page 74 uh, mentions drought. And obviously, we're going through a drought. So, what is the process CRPD has to make an application in reference to the impact of drought on our district? And if you could expand on that. So are you referring to one of the actions in your action plan matrix that deals with drought or are you referring to the ranking of the drought? There's no ranking. It's... It was the list in the report of the different types of hazards that we might encounter, drought being one of those, and we find ourselves in the midst of that. Until this weekend. Yeah, so I'll, I didn't. Right, so like I, I think I could, um, I actually can uh, probably help you out, Director Lang. So in the staff report, it's just mentioned drought of a variety of different hazards, but specifically in the hazard mitigation action plan matrix, action number oh c uh crpd5 is specifically and six are both related to drought so those actions so it's retrofitting irrigation components with bubblers low angle directional sprays smart controllers reducing water consumption and then removing non-essential turf drought tunnel and planch mulch ground cover this is on page 84 um irrigation modifications and incorporating you know 
that into the design of new parks. That's what we have under our, you know, action plan matrix. So I suppose those are theoretically eligible for grant applications. So these were both, if you look in the sources of funding, these were both tasked under general fund. Um, typically FEMA does not um, fund for drought projects like replacing bubblers. Um, that that's not something that that FEMA typically does. What FEMA does do, which is where you can coordinate with surrounding areas, large mitigation projects, like for instance, if you have uh, stormwater diversion that's just flowing out and not not taken advantage of, but maybe there's a project to divert that stormwater into an area with the right type of soil so it can do groundwater recharge. Uh, that's something that, that FEMA will definitely fund for. Some of those larger drought mitigation projects are definitely fundable. And just because you don't have those in your action plan does not mean you can't participate in an action for that. Um, as soon as this plan is adopted, you can begin adding new actions or coordinate with other jurisdictions. So you can coordinate with the city. Typically, cities will initiate actions that deal with large drought mitigations, mitigation um, projects, and then districts will support that. Unless, of course, it's a water district, and that's a totally different situation. But for the park district, um, supporting other agencies in larger drought mitigation projects is definitely something that you can do. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have some other questions? Yes, Director Harper. Um, a few questions. Uh, first of all, on the, the list of agencies involved, and that's a, obviously a very extensive list, um, it looks like all of these are exclusively Ventura County agencies, which I guess would exclude Rancho Simi Recreation District, which has some of its facilities yeah in Ventura County and some of them in uh, LA County? No. Yeah, so this is strictly a Ventura County plan. Um, LA County has its own hazard mitigation plan. And I would not be able to answer the question on whether that district was offered the opportunity to participate in the plan. That's that's a question that you could definitely follow up with um, with Ventura County and find out if they were given that opportunity. And if not, then that's something that they could be offered for the next update cycle. Okay. Uh, the second question that I have, um, who comes up with the list of um, potential natural hazards? I mean, obviously, it depends on where you are in the county as to whether some of them are likely or unlikely. We're not very likely to be hit by a tsunami here in Caneo Valley. Right. Um, but know. definitely subject to, to wildfires. But it seems like a fairly extensive list, but <laughs> other parts of the country or even other parts of the state might have other hazards. Um, you, I, the, the one that comes to mind growing up in the Midwest is tornadoes. I guess that could be included as as a severe weather event. Yes, you you are absolutely correct. So the hazard list was developed um, in cooperation with a steering committee. There's a large public outreach component to hazard mitigation planning. It's one of the FEMA requirements. And a steering committee was developed mm -hmm. that encompassed a lot of different sectors, different agencies, governmental as well as non-governmental. So um, the steering committee developed this hazard list based on the previous plan, as well as looking at new hazards. So tornadoes is in your plan. Um, it's in volume one and it is under severe storms. And it's just a brief mention because when we were doing the hazard analysis for tornadoes, there weren't a lot of tornado events in the county, but there were a couple. So you'll you'll be able to see that when you take a look at that chapter in volume one. Okay. Um, another question, each of the agencies involved presumably has 
put together their their own um, section dealing with the hazard risks and hazard mitigation. Um, do you and or somebody at the county look at all of these and and try to figure out if there's some hazards that aren't being addressed or mitigated properly that perhaps whether it's our agency or some other agency should be doing something differently so that the county as a whole is is addressing all of these hazards? Yes, that's that's an excellent question. So when the hazard analysis is done, we have a risk assessor who uses a variety of methods to determine what the risk ranking is for each of the hazards. And um, some of it is done by a spatial analysis. If the hazard can be mapped, like for instance, floods, that's an easy one to map. There are FEMA flood maps that are used for that hazard analysis. And then there are other things that are a little harder to map like severe storms because they cover such a broad area. It's impossible to, to just pinpoint on a map where a severe storm is going to take place. So some hazards are assessed and ranked with more data, uh, they're, they're data heavy, and other hazards are assessed more qualitatively with local knowledge. Um, they're described in words rather than in numbers, in loss numbers. So there's a, a very intense process that our team goes through to analyze all of these hazards with different, um, through different things, whether it's looking at USGS shake maps for the hazard, um, the, the earthquake hazard, or um, slope analysis for the landslide hazard. And then what FEMA requires is that every hazard that is ranked high must have a mitigation action to address that hazard. So it covers everything that is ranked high. And it's interesting that in your plan, in the, the Ventura County plan, many of the jurisdictions coordinated on wildfire mitigation actions because those are so broad reaching and they really do impact the entire county they can at a time. So it's so they, they were coordinated because they had such a, a broad impact. Um, so yes, there are there is some coordination and we definitely do have to do a double check to make sure everyone is covering their high hazards with mitigation actions. Okay. And then just one last question. I appreciate all the information. Um, there's a table, it's table 1610, talking about hazard risk ranking, uh, page 83. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that's done internally by our agency or somebody at the county says, this is a very high risk rank and this is very low? I'm, I'm just curious as, you know, the, the, the highest ranking is for landslides, which I, I guess somewhere historically, we've probably had a landslide in the Canal Valley, but I'm unaware of it, but it's ranked very high. Obviously tsunamis is zero, that's not gonna happen, but drought is, is ranked as only a nine, which seems very low. Now, is that because mm -hmm. even though droughts actually happening right now, the hazard from drought isn't that big a deal? So everyone in California throws their hands up when they see a low ranking for drought because drought is number one on everyone's, drought and wildfire, number one on everyone's mind. So FEMA requires a risk ranking methodology for every hazard mitigation plan. And the way, and this ranking was not developed locally. It was developed by the um, consultant team, by Tetra Tech. And it looks at a lot of things like, for instance, the landslide. Um, and, and people wonder why, <laughs> why landslides? But it goes into the information from um, California Geological Survey and United States Geological Survey. It goes into post-fire debris flow maps, um, also the um, deep-seated landslide susceptibility maps. So it takes in 
data on soils, soil types, what the probability is, historical events. There are a lot of factors that go in. It's, it's a very data rich um, analysis. And then with wildfire, it goes into um, CAL FIRE FRAP maps. Um, and there's a couple of other things that are looked at with wildfire hazards. With drought, it's a totally different ball game because FEMA does not acknowledge that drought impacts buildings or that it kills people, that there's mortality involved. So the only impact analysis that we can look at is the financial analysis. And each of these rankings are done with a weighted average. So impacts to people's lives are weighted the heaviest and then impacts to structures are next in line and impacts to the economy are the lowest on the weighted scale. And since drought only has economic impacts, that's why it always goes low in the ranking. But the nice thing about this ranking list, it does not affect grant funding opportunities or grant prioritization. So if there's an action that is FEMA fundable for drought, this ranking chart has nothing to do with prioritizing that funding or whether the funding is received or not. This is just to establish metrics for FEMA for the plan. Okay, thank you for the very detailed answer to my question. You're welcome. Um, any other questions, comments? Well, I have one, I, I think, um, I was really quite intrigued with this entire report. And I thought with all of these cities that were here uh, participating, did you give us a, or, you know, the people that uh, did this, uh, Bill Palermo, et cetera, did you give them a template so that the entire report looks like this and we just sort of filled in so that it would work? Do you know? Yes. What I mean? Yeah, okay. we, we did. We actually deployed. Um, we call these sections where every jurisdiction has their own chapter. We call it the annexes. So the annex is, um, updates are a phased process. So we deployed them in three phases. And at the kickoff, at the beginning of the planning process a couple of years ago, we, we started with phase one. And that just deals with basically the, the who are we parts of, of the annex. So that goes into what area you take in, what, you know, who's on the planning team, the very basics. So then once that was updated, then the next part of it was the capability assessment. So that was phase two. And we checked in with planning partners through this whole process. Bill did a fantastic job. He was primarily spearheading this part of the annex update. So we'd go back and forth and he would provide some content and we would um, ask him for maybe some different things or a little bit of a revision. And then phase three is the heart of it, which is the action plan matrix, where it's kind of where the rubber meets the road. This is what we want to do with, with the plan. So yes, we do have a template and we deploy it in three phases. So it's a little bit easier to complete. Thank you. Because I thought Thank this you. is this is very detailed and I thought you probably wanted to have some continuity between all of these different cities and organizations for your report. Absolutely. I was really quite impressed with it, so. Well, thank you. I will pass that on to our team. You know, we love what we do and we have a really good uh, reputation with Cal OES as well as FEMA Region 9 on writing plans that are easy to read and easy for them to re review because they do. FEMA and Cal OES both reviewed your annex very carefully. We addressed comments that they had uh, specifically related to your annex so that it would it would pass the review. Fabulous. Well, thank you. Thank you for all of your work. Um, so I guess we will move on to approving this or recommending this resolution. This is a resolution. So would anyone, oh, you have, George, I, I'm Director Lang, I should always look for more comments. Okay. Okay, this is more for staff, um, General Manager, specifically on the fact that this is a plan that you wanted to join, have CRPD join. Um, 
in your mind, do you have some specifics that you would be um, applying for or is this? Great, great question. And no, we actually don't have a like, here's a specific grant we're trying to target. But being in this position of having a plan adopted as part of the whole, it lets us participate with the others. And so, you know, you may recall, I, I can't remember what proposition it was, but we had to have our big uh, planning meeting that we'd meet at Cayagas and there'd be um, water money associated with that. And we actually have worked with the city to do like stormwater capture projects and stuff like that. So I actually don't know where the funding came from because someone else was doing that. We just had to provide the land for it. But um, it's it's just being part of a bigger, I think, in reality, the city or the county is going to probably be the primary lead on these big giant projects. I don't know if digging wells or anything like that counts, but um, or you know, establishing groundwater here or reclaimed if that would ever get there for for drought. I don't know, but um, it's it's just great to be poised to say yes, we can participate or yes, we can chase that grant down if we have this plan approved. Yeah, yeah it's just like having another arrow in your quiver you know, if something hap is to happen, but I was just curious and Jim, said, oh, here's something that we can uh, apply for a grant or something. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. And do we have a um, someone to recommend that we adopt this resolution? Did, yes, Director Tuffer. If I could, this is a question for staff. And for, it probably doesn't make any difference, but in in the resolution itself, the term used is adopting volume one, which in my, in my opinion is slightly different from accepting and definitely different from approving. Um, I, I, I guess I'm wondering if it, if it makes any difference to change the rec recommendation to be consistent with the resolution itself and, and say adopting the um, CRPD section as opposed to um, accepting. <clears throat> so I think that's for me and I'm, I'm looking at the resolution and I'm not finding accepting versus adopting. It says now therefore be it resolved the Canoe Record Park District adopts in its entirety volume one. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's, that's the resolution itself but in the, in the recommendation that we're voting on the recommendation says um, we're, we're adopting the resolution, accepting the CRPD section of the hazard mitigation plan. And what I'm suggesting is changing the word from accepting to adopting. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I use that wording. That's totally fine. Yeah. Okay. In, in that case, I would like to move approval of uh, the staff recommendation to adopt resolution 090822-A, adopting the Caneo Recreation and Park District section of the Ventura County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan 2021 to be read in title only, all future readings to be waived. And can that be read, please, Mrs. Render? No, I'll second that. You're going to second it before we read it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right, so it is now seconded and now we'll read it. Resolution number 090822-A, a resolution of Canaria Recreation and Park District authorizing the adoption of the Ventura County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. And might I just, again, uh, say having worked with Megan, she's been just a wonderful person, a great resource. Um, and I will say at the very beginning, I thought Tetra Tech was like a cold call sales call. So I would not take her calls for a while. So eventually <laughs> she got through to me and was like, hey, hey, I'm actually trying to help you. So thank you for being That's persistent, cool, Megan. <laughs> it, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it, hazard mitigation is not always hot on everyone's list of things to do, but I love being able to support well, your efforts and thank you all so much. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. You were very thorough and it was very delightful meeting you. Thank you. It was, thank it was you. a pleasure being, being here. Thank you. Take care. Okay, we're moving on to a budget adjustments for the fiscal year. And this will be uh, Mrs. Smith. 
Yes, good evening, Chair and Directors. So we have year-end budget adjustments and budget adjustments for our current year. Um, so first I'll briefly review um, last year, the year end for fiscal year 21-22. It's not technically necessary that we do this. Our revenues exceeded our expenses, so there's no issue on that end. Um, but for us, it's kind of good to have a record where we identify those work centers that went over their budgeted expenses and, and document why. And then when we're trying to go forward and look at budgets in the future, we can look back and see if it's really a trend or a one-off expense that caused these overages or something we should prepare for in the future. So that's really the purpose of the year-end budget. It's not that we were, uh, our, our expenses exceeded our revenues. So to that end, the work centers that we identified that went over budget are listed in the uh, staff report and then the attached budget adjustment um, with the revenue source and the expense appropriation. The first was MRCA computer services, and this is literally we have an accounting system that both CRPD and MRCA share. We had a fixed term for 10 years as part of the contract, and that expired, and the pay rate changed dramatically more than we thought. So that's the reason for that. We do have an annual agreement with MRCA where they do pay for that portion of the contract, and that's been reflected in the, the agreement with them going forward. So that's the MRCA one. Um, and I don't think it'll be a surprise to anybody that our water and fuel were more expensive than budgeted this year. So those are the next two items. And then we have contract part-time instruction contracts and part-time staffing for various recreation centers. REC does a great job with Rochelle and her staff of making sure that when we do increase programming and um, services that we are getting the revenue to offset those. Um, so we were able to provide more programming, largely coming out of COVID. We've been able to do more than we budgeted in, um, a year previously. So it's all good news. And for the sake of this, we just grouped them all together into one budget adjustment, citing the increase in property tax. So that's last year's year end budget adjustments. And, um, I'll stop for a minute if anyone has questions on those. Any questions? No. Yep. Chuck has a question. Chuck, okay. So I believe what you're saying, Melissa, was it, it, rather than having the entire revenue sources, the the property tax, it could have, you could have broken it out because we've had uh, higher than expected revenues from our various programs in these centers. Correct. But just for ease of accounting, we're using the three hundred forty-three thousand. Uh, of property, additional property taxes. As an correct, adjustment. correct. It all goes to the same pot. So for ease of accounting is that, but I could have listed Borchard, Caneo, TO all exceeded their, their revenue expectations, which is great. Great, thank you. Yeah, Madam Chair, I did have a question. Uh, yes, please. I, I'm just trying to uh, distinguish, we get to the end of the year and we have you know money left over in the bank and we try to set that aside as we've, as a policy for pensions, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, to to get that, you know, continue to to fund that. This is this is not that process. What we're doing here, if trying to restate what I think I heard, is is you need to move money to certain funds to accommodate those funding ex exceedances. Is that a word? Uh, I get what you mean. I I'll just I just made it up. There we go. Excess. <laughs> uh, to, just to kind of balance the books. Yes. It, it, that, which, so it's really a separate process. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Just want to make sure I okay, was, it was keeping my math together. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions at this time? Okay. You have more? Yes. I, so now I get to talk about this year. So we have um, one kind of new proposal for this year, and that's for the therapeutics program. There's been increased revenue for the past two years, and we have an increased staff need there. And so we felt comfortable um, increasing the assumed revenue from that center and the part-time salaries for that center. So that's the one new budget adjustment for this year that we're recommending. The last page, I think it's page 94, is the biggest chunk of this. And these are all of the carryover projects. And so this is completely dependent on project timing. We had just a record capital year. So most of these are capital projects that were started last year. And this is just the balance of that budget from last year as of June 30, allowing us to carry it onto this year and keep those projects going. So 
the whole list is there and I'm happy to answer any questions on those carryovers or I'll defer you to Tom. <laughs> I think it's not who's here. not here. <laughs> okay, Director uh, Nichols. Uh, not that I expect it to happen, but if the board says, no, we're not going to allow this money to be carried over, what happens to that money? It's already been allocated, but wasn't used. Right. So that would drop to fund balance. And then when we do the annual review of the unassigned fund balance, and we're touching on some of it later tonight with the playgrounds. Yes. Um, item, it would be part of that available pot. So if it all wanted to drop to fund balance, we could talk about how to reallocate those funds. And since these projects are either in some process of completion, whether it's maybe just getting started or maybe just wrapping up, and that funding were to have to say, no, no, we're not going to carry it over. You got to come back. They would have to come back for each, every project and say, hey, we need this money or it doesn't happen. I would expect so, yes. Okay. Just just that would be sure. very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say I just want to make sure what the what the options are. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, not that I expect that to happen, but uh I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, no further questions. Yes, it was a very thorough report. Yes. So do I have a recommendation? Uh, are you through yet? Are you through? Oh, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Director Holt, is that a recommendation? Yes, I um, I have two recommendations. I guess you can do both. But um, that we approve the proposed uh, fiscal year 2021-22 budget adjustments on Exhibit A, and then also the approved pro uh, proposed. Uh, fiscal year 2022 to 23 budget adjustments on exhibits B and C. Do we have a second on that? I'll second. Thank you, Director Huffer. All approved? Aye. 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 Um, motion carries. All right, so now we're going to the award bid, and <laughs> Mr. Hare is not here, so. Mr. Friedel, are you going to be talking? I, I will try to channel Mr. Hare, who might might be at this point sitting at home with his feet up laughing that I'm doing this and he's not. Um, so Mr. Hare and Mr. Mooney, uh, you, if you if you recall, this is a special meeting because our meeting was scheduled for the first. It's the eighth. Um, they had already had a consultant coming and a community you know, input meeting organized for tonight at the Borchard Skate Park. So that's where he and, and Mr. Mooney are. So you are stuck with me trying to do a, uh, a park playground uh, staff report. And it, of course, happens to be one of the more complex involved park award bid uh, playground reports that we've you know had in many years. But I am going to try to slow it down and uh, cover it uh, in a way that hopefully I understand and you understand. So in a normal year, CRPD will do two, three playgrounds, occasionally in a rare occasion, maybe four. So this is eight playgrounds all in one shot. And the reason that we, and, and, uh, and as you'll see, um, the uh, picnic um, shelter at Teo Park and the picnic tables as a bid alternate uh, at Canal Creek North. So the reason that there are so many playground improvement projects in this one year has to do with the type of funding that we were awarded from the state. Um, and if you recall, this was the um, Senator Stern and Assembly Member Irwin kind of went to bat for CRPD in, in the aftermath or the middle of COVID when they realized CRPD had not received any COVID relief funding. We were, you know, said, hey, here's 3.3 million. Some of that's being spent on the teen and senior center. We had 2 million allocated for some other reason. It was going to be these playgrounds. Um, but the state needs a method in how to give the money out. And it isn't just a check without strings. So the state's strings that are attached to the money require that they go, it had to go through state parks, um, I believe. So state parks has a kind of a template form grant thing with conditions and so to <laughs> accept this money we have to make sure all the work is done by the 24th or it reverts back or 2024 or it reverts back 
to the state, it has to be a project that they approved of. Playgrounds are super understandable, super easy. You don't have to have a lot of justification. And they, um, if you under budget, if you over budget, if you if you seek more for the playground than the state gives you. So in other words, hey, we said we needed a million for this playground and it only came in at 800,000. The state keeps the extra two, even though we were granted the 3.3. So all that said, we intentionally like under budgeted the playground projects for the grants, which meant the district would have to kick in more money. And then and then you'll see the reason that the it was budgeted light and we need a little more money. The, the bids came in a bit higher than we thought, but not outrageously higher, but definitely, definitely higher than we anticipated. So I'll go through that now. You'll see there's uh, eight recommendations, the first four and the second four. So you're either gonna, you're, you're either gonna, um, well, you're either gonna approve none or you're gonna approve <laughs> one through four, or you might say, yes, let's do one through eight. Um, staff's recommendation is to go for one through eight, uh, in part because the funding, the money is available in our unassigned fund balance, and we're doing projects that we know the community is really interested in. And on top of that, we got a really good um, base bid and bid alternate from the the different firms. Um, you know, ones I think the low bids about four hundred, five hundred thousand lower than the next highest bid. So we know we got a really really good bid. So we do want to do the work. So basically with that said on Tuesday, July 19th of 2020, they opened uh, nine interested bidders took um, a walk, a pre-bid meeting. They had a pre-bid meeting on July 19th. Um, we opened the bids on August 15th. The low bidder was unlimited engineering and contracting. You can see that uh, the base bid and the bid alt are, you know, um, highlighted on page 101. And what is also good about unlimited engineering is we've actually had them as the low bidder on other projects. So, you know, sometimes, not always, sometimes with low bidders, you really struggle with getting your project done the way you want. Unlimited, that has not been our experience with unlimited. And so they've been the low bidder on Teo Park uh, Playground, Rancho Caneo Playfield, and on at Old Meadows Park. So they've done playgrounds with us in the past. So we're we're glad that they were the low bidder. Um, the bid alternate one, you'll see the picnic tables and benches at Caneo Creek North. Um, so you can read there. Um, there is this annual ongoing maintenance because of the wood and paint material that are all the benches at all the big um, shade structures there. And it is a lot of staff work to keep them clean and turned over at the rate that we rent them out and people use them. And so <laughs> staff's been kind of saying there's got to be a better way. And so we actually have included more and more of the um, recycled plastic benches into different parks on more of a one-off, two-off basis. And they're really pleased with how they, they work. So they're like, you know, if we just had these, it, you know, at the big picnic areas, we could, you know, we can use a pressure washer. We can, you know, get the stuff cleaned up a lot faster and, and get out of there. So, you know, staff, staff would love to be able to change out uh, the picnic tables at, at the, at Canal Creek North. Um, not an inconsequential sum. So you can see that's an additional 170,000. So in part, the reason this is broken into, you know, the first four recommendations and then the second four, it's because, uh, you know, bid alt was something we thought would be nice. We weren't quite sure what that would look like. We think the low bid came in so low on that because we think that the low bidder is going to be reselling the tables so they're going to actually because we thought it was going to come in way higher to be honest on the picnic tables but we think they're planning to resell the tables that they take out so um so that you know we'll, they'll have an income offset for the cost of the new tables so um I'm trying to make sure i answer all the questions basically the breakdown for the cost of each and every playground is on page 102 the the original budgeted amount along with the additional appropriation requested and how that totals to the total base bid. And so you can see that's 
almost 4.6 million, 4.595. With the bid alt, it goes up to, to 4.7, um, six, six, uh, $4,765,000. So again, staff's recommendation is that we do rely a bit on the fund balance. Um, and Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're looking at 1.2 or 1.195. 1.37. 1.37. Yes. Sorry. We we have 3.17 of a unassigned fund balance available. And it's to do all this would be 1.37 of that 3.17. And that's on so page 1. 104. So 1.37 of an additional appropriation on top of what's already in the budget for the playgrounds and projects Correct. included here. So that's really what's different about this. Normally, when we come to you guys with, hey, we got a couple playgrounds, two or three playgrounds usually within or close to the you know budgeted amount this is clearly beyond that so that's what makes this a little different than a normal year but again for reasons explained there's reasons that um, we wanted to do a lot of playgrounds um, and um, why we want to um, make sure that we can maximize and use every state dollar that's available so with that i'm available for questions Oh, and you know what? Oh, shoot. No, don't wait. I did all this. I, I got, yeah. So thank you, staff, for throwing up the map. We do have a map of the different playgrounds that are involved. And I'm actually going to go from, I don't have the map in front of me, and I can't actually, wait, maybe with my glasses, you can see it. <laughs> okay, now I can see it with my glasses on. So, yeah, guys, I can't see anymore. So, um, because the public can see this, I'm gonna kind of very quickly go through um, and maybe you guys can see generally where they're located. They're spread widely, distributed widely across the entire community. So there's, you know, three or four, maybe if depending on where, you, you know, in Newbury Park area, uh, four in the Central Teo area and one in the Westlake area. So if I kind of went through them, um, I'm not sure if the photos are, yeah. So here we go really quick because Again, board, I know you have this in your packet, but maybe someone watching doesn't and wants to see it. So we do have the photo sims of the different playground improvements. Um, Dos Vienos is, is, is this, is a, this is a hefty playground, including an expansion of the current playground. So there's Dos Vienos. We'll go to Sycamore Neighborhood Park. That's, um, you know, uh, also in the Dos Vienos area. And, um, you know, it's a creek themed, um, and it's got that, uh, it, Andrew, but tells me that's a sycamore tree in the mm. middle. That's mm. to represent a sycamore tree. That's what that shaded sure. thing is in the middle. <laughs> Next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Newbury Gateway, again, that's actually, um, we, we have the farm elements and Newbury oh, Gateway, post office. Next one, Banyan Park. Um, yeah, banyan trees, exactly, very good. And, the, and you know, it incorporates, they're gonna actually have a bobcat added there to the playground. I don't think it's, it's a custom thing, but that's for the banyan bobcats. Uh, next one, Suburbia, that's actually a really tiny park. And this is where I know I've been here a while because I can remember doing Suburbia. So now I've been here long enough that this is the second time we've redone Suburbia <laughs> since, since I've been here, so. Um, yeah, I think I can remember Suburbia being one of the first ones when I got here. So we're going through. What, what is the little item on the right? Uh, that was a dinosaur head, I believe. I think it's a dinosaur. Um, oh, yeah. Like a, like, ah. yeah, it's a, like a T-Rex skull. Uh, yeah. So there's kind of a dinosaur bones That's kind of funny. theme there. Next one. Uh, wildflower play field, obviously it's wildflower themed. You can kind of see the top of the posts all have sort of that flower and bee insect kind of theme. Next one. And Canal Creek North, this is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the most expensive one for a good reason. It's the district-wide park and the, you know, busiest of all the parks. So this, this is a over million dollar playground. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's two playground sites on Canal Creek North. Correct. So this is this it's both i think it's both the five through 12 and the two through five both both playgrounds are getting an upgrade i asked if the neos was staying and they said yes so they're keeping the neos um keep going one russell um this is our westlake park um 
So it's kind of got a net theme, net climber theme. And then finally, or that might be the final one. Is that the final one? Yeah. Because the last one is, of course, the shade structure that's already been taken down because it literally was in, it rotted to the point of collapse at um, Thousand Oaks Park. So that uh, is part of the bid package was the replacement of that shade structure. And then again, as I mentioned, the bid alternate would be to basically change out all the picnic tables at Caneo Creek North. So you won't be putting up any more shade structures like that. So it actually, I do, I, I want to say it was metal rot. I think it was a metal, yeah, metal posts. They think they were just not super substantial, four by four metal posts. And, uh, you know, if, if water can get in and, and kind, kind of at the base that you can rot out at the base. Now, frankly, urine, dog urine will eventually corrode away a metal pipe over, you know, decades. So those. Thought we got rid of all the wood moss because the termites and rot and so forth. Yeah. So I was surprised to hear that. Yeah. So with that, I am available for questions. Are there any questions? No. Nope. Well, what? I think the, the map you referred to it does display the district wide application of the uh, funds and parks and so forth. So. That should make our community very happy to see that, you know, we're not just doing one area, but diversifying the funds and the improvements. Good, good job, Tom and Andrew and Tim and staff. And Director Nichols, did I see your hand? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Friedel, thank you for the presentation. I did have a question, though. Uh, what are the circumstances where a bid alt bid alternative is proposed? Is that for the benefit of the contractor, for the benefit of the district or both? I'm just curious, what, what is the it, thought process behind doing that type of approach? It's mostly, um, so so it's a, it's, a, it's a technique or strategy that a you know, more sophisticated <laughs> sort of uh, uh, staff, like a Tom Hare who really knows what he's doing, so when you think you might have a chance to get a little extra work done within a budget, you'll sometimes say, you know, maybe maybe I can squeeze in even more stuff with this one. So we'll do an add all to see if I can get the low bid and actually include this extra work in the overall budget that I have. So it's Tom's way of like trying to make sure he maximizes every capital dollar because he's afraid if he comes in under budget for a project, Melissa and I will say, no, okay, good job, Tom. That hundred extra, hundred fifty thousand left on the table. We're going to use it for something you don't want. So Tom's really good about trying to maximize the dollars that get spent on capital. He's he's very good at that. So in this instance, though, with increasing costs and everything, you know, virtually every playground came in over, and he had to because of that state grant strategy. He had to make sure that we were going to be under bid so that we could spend every state dollar and not have to give them back any money because mm -hmm. we had to do a separate grant for each. Uh, playground project. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then my second question is with this extended capital expense for this year, and obviously the general trend has been, as you mentioned, three or four playgrounds a year. Does that mean in the next couple of years that we won't see playgrounds or we'll still maybe see one or two or what, what do you expect to happen? Um, maybe, maybe a pause of a year and then maybe like one or two, and then we'll probably be back to normal because of these, these projects are mostly the ones that were in years three, four, five coming right. up anyway. That's so we I kind expect. of scooped okay. them. Yeah. So All we right. moved them forward. So again, we do that. You guys approve those two years in the CIP, but we are, you know, in the budget and then we have the 10 year plan. So if, if things get magically moved up, you know by the board and we have the funding and we can go forward that frees up like you got more maneuver room for doing more projects in the out year so that means either some things can slide from your 70 or four or maybe it might mean we insert a project that we hadn't really budgeted for exactly mm -hmm. so okay very good all right thank you madam chair any other questions yes director hopper um, just to make sure I'm understanding it, Jim, on, on the page 102 for each of the individual playground projects, the 
the original budgeted amounts, 850, 250, 250, et cetera, et cetera. These were the amounts that we uh, submitted to the state for each, each of these playground projects. That's what was budgeted. I don't know if that's the exact amount we sent to the state. I'd have to remind myself on the, each grant application. I don't. So yes, those are the total project amounts where we were saying that's how much this playground is going to cost. That does not mean it's the amount we were expecting to receive from the state. So we probably said if we budgeted 850, maybe we said 750 was the state and the district was matching 100 or something like that. Okay. So we always had that buffer, but this is okay. the total project. Okay, just, I was just curious. Um, first, I meant to start off saying it's really exciting that we can do all of these projects at once as opposed to having to spread them out over three, four, five years. So yeah, I agree with what the director Lang said, the community should be just thrilled with this. Um, on the bid alternative, um, is this every picnic table at Canal Creek North, not just the ones and the three picnic structures, but also all of the individual picnic tables that are scattered throughout the park? Yeah, so it's every wooden table. So I think we already have a few, we've started testing out some of the, the plastic, for lack of a better, recycled plastic tables. So we actually have a few of those. You, you have to look for them, but we have some in there already. So anything that's still wood, we'd change out. Okay. And is this going to be somehow staged so that we don't remove every single picnic table at the same time and then we can't rent out any of the three picnic areas? So Tom is very good about always going to rec and saying, okay, who's got it scheduled for when? What's the plan? And when can we slide the work in? So he's really good about doing that. So yes, of course, we don't wanna, we wanna minimize any downtime. So my guess is we'd probably wanna do this and you know, the winter rainier months when a lot of the rentals are a little slower, that kind of thing. So um, I don't, I don't know exactly when the the tables might do it, but um, yeah, we're very sensitive to the fact that we have revenue coming in from the use of the facility. We would probably wouldn't be doing this during the chili cook-off no, or the no. fruit fest or any of the other big events going on. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, Director Lang. Yes. Um, and listening to Chuck's comment about the, uh, that I had mentioned also about the uh, whole community being uh, addressed and benefiting from this, maybe this is some type of a PR opportunity, you know, with Tom and a map, you know, at one of the parks or, you know, talking about it. And I don't know what goes on TOTV, but I just think that listening again to, uh, Director Huffer's comments had just sunk into my little brain that, hey, uh, I think our community would like to know about this. And I think just the fact that this doesn't happen <laughs> very often the first time, uh, we should take advantage of that. So we, we do have a 60th anniversary coming up and we're throwing all these projects out right at our 60th anniversary. Gee, what nice timing that is. Yeah. But just somehow get it out in the public, you know, TO TV or however you, our PR people do it. I just think it's a look again, looking at this map. It, wow, that's very impressive. Absolutely. Yes, I think we are very impressive. I, uh, I concur. Do we have any other questions or comments? All right, do I have a recommendation? Uh, recommendation. We do all eight, right? I think we should just, yeah. Yes, I'll Shall be happy we, to make a recommendation. Do we, is there anyone who would like to discuss not doing all eight or are we in agreement that we want to recommend for well, let's, let's, all eight? Let's, let's get a motion and then we can vote on the motion. All right, that sounds like a good idea. So please, Director Huff. I would like to move that we approve staff recommendations one through eight. Do I have a second? I have a second. Okay, I think yes. Director Holt had her hand up. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, I guess that that, that uh, passed. So that's how we'll do it. <laughs> Short to the point. <laughs> yes, that, that was a good way to do that. All right, moving along um, to 9D, we have a memorandum of understanding with 
the city of Thousand Oaks, and it looks like this will again be Mr. Frito. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Cusworth and members of the board. Um, the item on page 117 is to ask the board whether the district should enter into the MOU with the city of Thousand Oaks regarding vehicle fuel purchases. This is, um, you know, this is a reflection of staff continuously making improvements. So um, for 30 years now, we've been using the city's MSC to get gas for district vehicles because somebody said it was okay many years ago and gave us the, you know, here's how you do it. Here's the, you know, they invoiced us. We paid all the time. You know, we had a system for paying. But when the city, um, I guess they extended that offer to the school district just recently and the school district approached them and someone said, you know, we should have an agreement. Let's do the same agreement we have with CRPD. And yeah. oops, there, there was no agreement. So we are basically trying to memorialize a mm. practice that's been going on for 30 years. So we've been mm. fueling at the MSC for 30 years and the city's now asked us to um, put that into an MOU form. It, it's, 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 um, this is a very, um, you know, not ironclad. So they can say, yeah, forget it pretty much without notice. And we could say, yeah, we don't want to buy from you anymore without notice. But generally what happens is we get gas at a much reduced rate if we fuel up at the MSC and they have some rules that they want us to follow and which we do. So with that, um, we recommend that we approve the MOU and I'm available for questions. Um, any questions here? So, okay, Director Hopper. A real quick question. Um, so the agreement is um, good until June 30th, 27. Did I miss somewhere where most of the MOUs that we do, there are additional two or five or 10 year um, extensions? And I maybe I'm just missing it, but I didn't see that in the MOU. Yeah, so we weren't the drafters of this. So, you know, that wasn't really the city's preference. I don't even know if we really negotiated or debated it, but we, we weren't. You know, we pretty much took what their form okay. and what was. So, yeah. Then the ones that we do, we typically have. Yeah. So, I guess if there's a problem at the end of this, we'll discuss it. So, sounds like a good deal. Um, do we have a recommendation? Anyone want to? Sure, please, yeah. Director Nichol. Thank you. Yes, I would uh, recommend that the board authorize general manager to enter into the Memorandum of Understanding with the City of Thousand Oaks regarding fuel purchases as recommended by staff. A second, Director Hull. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 And, and I do want to say something very That's kind about our friends at the city having allowed us, you know, over the years. As of course, gas prices were very high in you know the past year, but you know we estimate we save almost thirty-eight thousand dollars a year thanks to the city saying, "Hey, you guys can use the facility we have." So again, another. Another reason to be grateful to our partner agency at the city. I think it sort of shows the fact that that's just went on the wonderful relationship that we have with the city, the amount of trust and the amount of cooperation that we have in this city between um, our three agencies. Isn't that it's really wonderful? So thank you. Um, moving on now, we have our um, the board policy for playing patriotic music at the CRPD concerts. Uh, this, uh, director, yeah, no, it's, it's, I'll, I'll take it, although it, you guys remember this was, um, yeah. Director Nichols brought this up during our last board meeting under items for mm -hmm. subsequent agendas, and you guys said, yeah, let's let's put that on. So I tried to take, you know, the sentiments from Director Nichols, and and, and um, I think he, he handed out a written, you know, um, page, so I, I plagiarized ruthlessly from your memo. <laughs> I, and, I would do the same thing. <laughs> And before you is the policy, um, and it's it's short and simple, a, a, a one paragraph policy, but it does capture what you know is the is is uh, you know putting on a federal holiday uh, a patriotic you know song, national anthem, of course, but you know there could be a similar patriotic song at, at any given concert. So with that, I'm gonna go with questions, and of course, any questions, yes, Director Hall. I move the staff recommendation. Oh, okay. <laughs> to, to play the national anthem at CRPD concerts in the park when held in association with the national holiday. And do we have a second? I'll second, but I do have okay. a, a quick question for staff. Okay, thank you. Where did you find that superb young lady to do the national anthem at our last concert? It was wonderful. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yes, okay, yeah. She was great. Yeah, she, she was good. Thank you. Yes, I also wanted to comment. I think that the, um, the audience was really quite moved. And now that you said that it was Megan and Brianne, you have to think that we do have quite a lot of talent going here in uh, CRPD. So it was a very nice addition to the concert. So. I would second that to me. It just kind of, it just kicked off the concert the way that I thought it should have been done. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think everyone seemed to find the same feelings. Uh, and I also was talking with Rochelle after the, after the anthem during the, while we could Shout barely hear each other <laughs> in the middle of the concert, uh, where she talked already about how they maybe will be recruiting from the high schools and things, which to me was perfect, you know, to get them on stage. As, as you, you just mentioned, Madam Chair, we have such a wonderful breadth of talented youth in our community that we see in our, you know, arts program and our music program. Might as well highlight them, literally give them the stage and, you know, out in front of the people who don't necessarily see them. And what a wonderful performance that was. That was just terrific. So thank you for the staff and uh, for the report. Thank you. I, I think it was also nice because I know that in public schools, we don't often sing as many patriotic songs as we'd like to. And this is brought up frequently. So this is very nice for children to be hearing the breadth of songs that we have. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of bring it out there. So it was Absolutely. very nice. So, um, so we've had a motion and a second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Moving on. So, F. It looks like this will be Mr. Smith again. Sounds so fun. Yes. Go thank you, me. Chair and Directors. So, um, we're all familiar with our reserve funds. Um, our reserve fund for pension stabilization is to address our retiree liabilities. And at the end of the year, as Director Nichols mentioned, um, we have a standing policy that any of the salaries and benefit savings at year end automatically get transferred to this pension stabilization fund. The logic being it was going to be spent on staff anyway. So let's make sure it's set up um, to fund their retiree liabilities. So that means that we have 6.7 million in our reserve fund for pension stabilization. So for our reserves, we keep those in our pools largely at the county, and they don't get much return because they're so available for us if we need cash. Um, and that's why we have something like that, the 115 trust, where it can maybe gain a little bit more because it's more of a long-term investment because you don't foresee needing these funds for retirement for several years. So we met with the Finance and Audit Committee and recommended that we put $3 million of that $6.71 million into the 115 trust, um, especially since we do anticipate that the CalPERS report next year is going to show a poor performance in 21, 22. So our liabilities are expected to increase. Um, that still will allow us to have about 3.71 million in our reserve for this purpose, where if for some reason we were cash poor, that's more than enough to cover our annual contribution that we're required to give to CalPERS without having to pull any out of the trust. Um, so that's my short little summary of the situation and um, I'm available for questions. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, Director Nichol. Yeah, just you prompted a question at that last comment about making sure we have something on hand in case CalPERS needs to, hey, give me some money. Uh, is there a certain amount, uh, like is that a percentage? How is that calculated? So you know, what, what we should be keeping on hand in the event that were to happen? So the way the actuarial report for CalPERS does it is where it'll take your total liability and then where your current asset value and your projected liability, and then they divvy it up and they come up with their annual unfunded annual liability contribution for the districts. So it's about 1.2 to 1.4 million on okay. average. Okay. I expect that might be a bit higher next year because of the poor performance that they are already telling people that they had last year. So I wanted to say like, maybe at least have 2 million in case. And the district has not had a history of having a cash poor situation where we, we needed to tap into reserves to do that. But this ensures that we would be able to if something happened with cash in okay. next year. We've already actually made our payment for this year. Okay, so it's it's that 1.1 to 1.4 that I was interested in. Yeah. So, okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Director Hopper. And just <clears throat> a comment um, to the other board members other than Susan, we're in the committee. 
page 133, the, the numbers that you have there, the assets for under pension liability, assets at PARS 9.9.0 and the assets and reserves 6.7. Those are the numbers before we approve this transfer. Correct. Assuming we, if we approve this transfer, then the assets of PARS would actually be 12.0 and the assets in the reserve would, would be 3.7. Correct. Do we have any other questions or comments? Okay, can we make a motion for this recommendation, Director Huffer? Yes, I'd like to move that we authorize transfer of $3 million to the district's pension stabilization 115 trust. Do we have a second for this? I'll second. Okay, Director Hall. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. So moving on to adopt the MRCA final balance, this would be Mrs. Smith again. Yes, thank you. Um, as a quick refresher, the MRCA is a joint powers authority um, made up of the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, CRPD, and Rancho Simi Rec and Park District. Um, so as such, in addition to the MRCA board approving budgets, all three member agencies have to approve as well. CRPD this year is the last board, so all the other boards have approved this budget. Um, but some highlights for you is it is a record-breaking total budget amount. It's $105 million. That's, um, because of some very, very large projects. Um, the wildlife corridor uh, crossing over the 101 bridge is a big one, um, and then multiple camp rebuilds from fires throughout the state. Um, and then similar to CRPD, we have some anticipated increasing in revenues based uh, on the relaxing COVID restrictions for anything that involves gathering. So special events and filming, they're anticipating some increases in revenues there. On the expense side, salaries and benefits um, are showing a big jump. That's because we're desperately trying to fill a lot of vacancies. Um, and insurance assumptions, um, insurance just keeps getting higher and higher. And Director Lang knows we reported at the board meeting yesterday. Um, you'll see we uh, budgeted, I think it went from 1.5 to 2.5 million for um, insurance. And then we got hit with um, even additional half a million more. So it's just insurance is, is tough for everybody. So that's an, a known expense that we're, we're working on. Um, and the other big change is the capital equipment budget. The fleet is very, very old. I think they've had 20 vehicles out to order for over a year and they're just waiting to receive them. So that's one of the reasons for the increase on that side. Um, and then I just wanted to make a note about how awesome our CRPD accounting staff is. Cause if you look at pages 143 to 150, you'll see all of the different budget by task for MRCA. And those are literally all of the different funding sources that CRPD staff is chugging into the system to do every single payment and payroll for staff and um, for MRCA. So just a shout out for the huge amount of work that, that, that goes into that. So with that, I'm available for any questions you may have. Do we have any questions? Uh, I have a question for staff. Thank you. I have a question for staff. If you know uh, this being the largest budget we've ever had, what was the second largest? Do you recall? I think it was last year at seventy-two million. Okay, because I kind of remember it being big last year too. Yeah, but I couldn't <laughs> remember the number. Thank you, Melissa. Good job. You, you did so much for the MRCA, it's very much appreciated. Uh, thank you, are there any other questions or comments? No, do we have a motion for this recommendation? Sure, I'll make a motion. Yes, thank you, Director Nichol. Yeah, just uh, recommend the, recommend the uh, approve the MRCA final budget for fiscal year 22-23 as recommended by staff. And a second on that? A second. Okay, Director Holt. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right, and now we are moving on to uh, 9H, and this is a call for nomination. Uh, with Director Nichols, do you, do you not have enough to do? <laughs> Jim said this was a very well-paid job. And, you know. That's what I thought. I mean, these uh, these extra positions you're taking up, they're not making you a millionaire. It, it, <laughs> not yet. No, I, I, not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. No, just okay. uh, just something of interest. All right. Is um, 
who is going to, does anybody want to talk about this? I have a, I don't have a name. Would you like to talk about this a little bit? Yes. Dr. Lang? Having been in this position previously for six years and the first representative from a Rec and Park District on LAFCO, um, it is very rewarding, but it's definitely different. I, I, <laughs> it was a real learning curve um, to, between LAFCO and CRPD and other boards that I've been on. So it will take extra work initially, but in my day, there are a lot of exciting things and you get a lot, depending, I was also on the state uh, LAFCO uh, board commission. And, uh, but there is a lot of interaction, there used to be a lot of interaction between Sacramento and the counties. So I think you'll really enjoy it. It's very rewarding, like I say, and uh, you, you do good well in this position. Uh, yes, Director Nichols, would yes. you like to say something? Yes, I, I'll, I'll just a quick little comment. At uh, the general manager's suggestion, I contacted our current representative, Elaine, over at uh, Rancho Simi, and uh, she said she'd been doing it for 10 years. So wow. I guess that's, you know, after George was doing it, she said, yeah, it'd be nice for someone to be able to have a chance to do it. Uh, I guess they do schedule monthly meetings, but lately they've only been meeting maybe four or five times a year. So that seemed manageable. So hopefully we'll keep up that same schedule. But no, it is something I'm interested in, uh, having spent a lot of time in the planning realm. Um, and I think just to, to get, as, uh, as Director Lang said, keep that the park and rec district involved at that level, I think is important because as uh, we'll talk more about it later, but just at the state level, it's just we're just kind of an afterthought. So I think the more we can get involved and keep our uh, you know, involvement in, in, in various levels, I think it's important. So be happy to uh, participate and do what I can at that, that agency, that level. Well, yes, Director I'm, Lang. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's okay. based on a comment uh, that Director N Nichols mentioned, you know, Elaine being in a position for 10 years, when I served, it was two years in the advisory, all of the city, this park district and the county, each had advisory members also that attended meetings. You couldn't vote, but you had two years to learn what was going on. And then the, you could serve four years on the actual LAFCO uh, committee. And uh, that all changed, you know, since I was on there. So, as you mentioned, Elaine has been in the position for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I like, not that I have any say, but um, I think the fact that you can uh, have other people is adding to the mix is, is a good idea, but apparently, you know, others thought differently, but uh, it's, it's a great uh, organization to be associated with, so good luck. Um, I have to say, I'd never heard of LAFCO until I went to one of the uh, Ventura County Special District meetings, and they had you know, a whole presentation. And I thought it was very interesting. And, you know, I congratulate you in wanting to increase your knowledge and learn more about, uh, you know, land acquisition and everything else that we have in our county. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. So does, uh, I'm just wondering though, this is a nomination you'll still be voted on by, or is this going to put you directly into that position? So you are approving a resolution nominating Director Nichols to fill right. the term of the regular, and then he would stand for election if other people were interested as well. But okay. I mean, other people from different agencies. Yes, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. So there, there would potentially be an election unless there weren't unless there was no one right. else that was interested. Right. Okay, right. All right, so do we have a motion for this recommendation? I so move. Okay, Director Holtz made a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Director Lang. Um, as you're sharing a microphone. <laughs> all right, uh, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, it's a resolution. It's a resolution. So, can we please um, read this resolution? I don't. I don't Number see it up here. I don't see it. Oh yeah, sorry. We had it attached to the staff report, but yeah, um, we don't do not have it. 
Yeah, we do. Sorry. Um, uh, well, yep, uh, that was our bad. That, yeah, no. So we, we don't have a reference to the resolution. There is a resolution attached. LAFCO does want to see that there's this official action other than, I suppose, our minutes. So with uh, for good order, if you wouldn't mind um, the resolution that's attached to that memo, if we could just get somebody to, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're comfortable, I think you've already made the motion in the second. So yeah, it maybe could be Aline could up. just read the resolution. Read the resolution. I'd love to. Okay. <laughs> resolution number 090822-B of the Canaro Recreation and Park District nominating Doug Nichols to fill the term of 1-1-2023 to 12-31-2026 for the regular special district member of the Ventura Local Agency Formation Commission. And since we've already made our motions, I think we can move on with that. Okay. Thank you. I, I just didn't, uh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, sorry. Right. We already voted, didn't we? No, we had motion, no second. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you guys remember all this. Okay. So it's, it's uh, red. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. It passes. Maybe we've done that so much. I thought we did it. All righty. So moving on, do we have any questions on the reports and announcements? Any questions or comments? Yes, Director Lang. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to point out on the park dedication fees, you know, for so long we were barely getting a few thousand dollars and uh, an accumulation. Oh, there's two months now. Uh, we got uh, thirty-seven million three hundred eighty-three dollars. Uh, so that is a, a nice addition that we uh, haven't experienced in a long time. And then under uh, item F, recreation highlights. I was wondering the photograph on uh, page one ninety-seven, the uh, lower left. Can you identify people in that particular photograph? Nice. Yeah. On the bottom Ooh. left, that's Tim Ooh. Hagel, uh, our general manager, and uh, Don from the newspaper on the oh, bottom left. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm just looking at that, as, and that individual on the right in that photo is really into it. So. <laughs> I didn't. That, well, I, I recognize somebody else on yes. this page. <laughs> Maybe wasn't quite as. Uh, oh, that does anybody else recognize something? Sorry. Somebody else on this page? An old, old fashioned outfit, maybe. <laughs> well, if you look at the top left, you'll see a woman in a white dress with some black ribbons on it. Who is that? Who is that? Who is that person? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They only give me black and white. <laughs> anyway, it's me. Somewhere, oh, somewhere in here. <laughs> anyway, good recreation uh, report. Thank you, Michelle. This I want. Any other comments? I did. Yes. Yeah, since Director Lang already mentioned the the charity karaoke, that was it was such a fun night. I only wish the air conditioning had been working oh. a little bit better. It was so hot there. <laughs> It's, it's warm, but the, the amount of money that that the CSVP raised was was spectacular. So, yeah, I I have to say that these are some of my favorite things to look at for the entire meeting. It kind of just makes it very real. So I appreciate your photos. And there was our um, now that we have the whole presentation, it made a lot more sense. Isn't this? Aren't these the teams from the Borchard Center? So I didn't think that much of it when I saw it before, but I thought, oh yeah, those are the kids. So that's wonderful. Okay. All righty. So let's go on to our department reports. So I guess we're not going to have a parks division report tonight, unless you're going to do that. Uh, I, I would just only say that the skate park meeting that Tom and Andrew are at tonight is actually occurring again this Saturday at 10. I think if anyone yeah, wants I to, think so. I, I think it's a 10, but I can, um, I will remember tomorrow oh. to send out info about when it is. So if anyone's interested in seeing that input process, it's happening on Saturday. Okay. I, 
I have a question about Saturday because Saturday night is the Vetrero, um, Rancho Vetrero. And um, uh, I was watching a, a weather channel, not the normal local channel. And supposedly it's just going to be really pouring on Saturday. And I wonder how that's affecting that uh, event. Um, I, did, I forwarded an email to all of you this afternoon. We did hear from Ride On, and they're planning to have the event, rain or shine. Oh, um, they have, I guess, a an area where that's, that's covered. covered. Okay, so I, thank you. Yes, an arena, I didn't have so. a chance to read that. Yeah. Okay, maybe so, I'll wear your high heels, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I hate it. Where are my boots? <laughs> but they are planning on having it. And what were the chances of this night being one that the weather might be? Yeah, I, it was a, a very unusual weather channel yeah. that I had been watching, you know, like uh, um, not the local channel, but it took care of our lo local area. And um, when we were out today, I actually counted 20 raindrops on the windshield. <laughs> 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 Okay, I'll put a little antidote today. It rained a little bit in Woodland Hills and my kids were screaming and running around. I mean, they're six years old. They don't haven't seen much rain in their life. We <laughs> rained, rained for about three minutes, but they, they were unbelievably excited. Again, I, the reason I thought of it is I think one said, I think there were a hundred raindrops. <laughs> I like that that was a huge amount. Okay. Um, Recreation Division, Mrs. Cowles. Sure, thank you, Chair Pessworth, members of the board. So just a couple of updates. One of the things, um, the Caneo Coalition for Youth and Families, which Susan is on that um, committee board, and just a quick little update. We had a meeting. We have one more meeting this year, and that um, board is made up of one elected official from city, school district, and here. Well, just so you know, two of the board members will not be returning next year for mm -hmm. sure. And one, we don't know if she's gonna get reelected or not. So we may have, we will have two hopefully new board members and then possibly an, an, another one. So just something to keep in mind that we'll be looking for when you guys all sign up for what committees you wanna be on that CRPD will have an open seat on that and along with the city and possibly the school district. Um, the 60th anniversary is coming up and our marketing team has worked very hard with um, Wyatt McCray's um, production company. Um, his uh, right-hand person, Gary uh, Tuchel, uh has been working with us and has done an excellent job. Um, Jim and I are the only ones that have seen the final video and super excited about it. And we're keeping it undercover. We have a plan. So we are going to be doing a sneak peek red carpet event for staff and board members only, probably in early October. And then we're going to do a birthday party for the community to see it in mid-November. And that will be anybody and everybody can come. And um, we're hoping, we're, I've got to confirm a location still not positive on it, but just wanted you to know. And so if you have any suggestions or um, anything for the birthday party one, um, you know, shoot me an email or give me a call and I'll see what I can do to get your idea into it. So it'll probably be like a presentation and a show of the, it's a little under 11 minutes, the video. So, and then let's see, summer was awesome. I haven't talked to you guys since summer ended. So staff did an awesome, awesome job, even with challenges such as not having a lot of staff. So, um, but revenue wise and the number of kids that we serve, they did a great job. Um, they're currently getting ready for the school year. We start a little bit later than school does. So all of our after school enrichment programs will be starting up soon. And um, music programs, I think, start up next week, some of them. So they're getting all excited and, and ready for that. So that is going on. And then just an FYI, we have a new marketing assistant that just started this week. His name is Juan Garcia, not related 
to Charlene Garcia. Uh, mm-hmm. Garcia. <laughs> they have the same last name, but we're super excited. He's a graduate from CLU, like just graduated. Um, so we're super excited to um, have him aboard. And so you'll be seeing him around taking pictures and doing mar- marketing stuff. So with that, I'm available for questions. Question? Yes, Director Hoffman. Yeah, you mentioned the the outreach program from the schools. Are you going to try again? Uh, I can't remember if it was last year, somewhere in the last few years, you, you've had basically recreation staff running a recreation program at a couple of the elementary schools. Are you going to try that again this year or... So we don't run after school programs. We run enrichment programs at about 14 of the elementary schools. And we've been doing that for a while. Um, Acacia last year, we started safe passage because we didn't have a, uh, a base for safe passage kids. So the school district and us worked together on a location and we did do kind of like an after school program for about 25 kids. Um, was that... Your question? Okay. So yeah, we're, we are going to still continue to do the enrichment programs. Um, The school district has worked with other organizations because they do have a grant um, and some dollars to run some after school programs. Um, We're not able, we're not licensed childcare. We don't do from time school gets out until six o'clock. So we're not able to do that, but we are helping them out with some other things like early out weeks and and camps and stuff like that. So okay. And then my other question, you mentioned the red carpet events. Yeah. You said early October. How early in October? Oh gosh, when are you in Hawaii? Hmm? When are you in Hawaii? Seventh. I'll try to plan around that. I don't know if I'll be able to, but I'll try. I was afraid of that. Okay. Yeah. I'll try. You'll be back for November though for sure. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we won't unless, show unless, we like, won't show it to anyone and it'll be the red carpet event sneak peek yeah. and then it'll come out in November. Yeah. So okay. That's the plan. All right. I just yeah. I, I just wanted to add that um I mean we've really had some good speakers this this uh last time and they talked about the wellness centers at the mm-hmm. school district. And it was a very, it was very eye opening to me. I, you know, that uh, there. I mean, one of the gals said, uh, "Oh, there are thousands of drop-ins because, in in addition to working with the students on a, a appointment type things, but sometimes they'll have a drop-in session, and they've had thousands of of uh, drop-ins showing a need, um, and the students are very open." because of of what they've been doing in in expressing problems that they think they're having and um you know as opposed to never telling anybody what's going on with them and um that that was really interesting to about this what the school district has been doing so what susan's talking about is for the Caneo coalition for youth and families at those meetings we invite someone as a guest speaker to each one of our meetings and they talk about things that are going on with youth and families in our community and our last guest speaker was um the mental health folks for that work with the school district and the school district last year started a um a wellness center so every high school has a, like a wellness center on campus and they've got um mental health folks that oversee it. And then they work with college students that actually come in and do their service hours to partner with them. And like, so students that might be having some kind of stress or emotional type thing, they would get a pass from their teacher, say they need to go to the mental health. They go to the mental health for like 20 minutes or so, and they can talk to someone about whatever it is that they needed to talk to someone about. So it's and it's it's going again this year. Any other questions or comments? Okay, um, Management Services Division. Thank you. So you've heard a lot from me tonight, so I'll keep it short. Um, so first, since we last saw you, Chris Byrne, who was our accounts payable, retired after 15 years. And we have a new staff, Jessica Gunnerson. Um, she comes to us with 10 years of AP experience, and we're really excited to have her. So if you see her around, say hi. <laughs> Um, we also now have two Jessicas. Um, we used to have two Michelles and now we have two Jessicas. So 
I'm going to take it as a good omen. Um, we're eager to close the year, um, with those budget adjustments we'll be able to. So thank you. And, um, our final audit for fiscal year 21, 22 is set for the week of September 19th. Um, and we are going to be releasing an RFP for a class and comp study as a reminder in our negotiations with the union, uh, we agreed to complete one, um, and we've been in communication with the union and we're hoping to release that this month. Um, have responses in October and then select an entity in November with de deliverables in the spring. So that's the current timeline. We'll see how it goes. Um, and with that, I'm available for questions. Any questions? Okay, we'll move on to our general manager's report. Um, I think I've talked probably enough tonight. I do wanna mention that I, I, uh, Capri has sent out a notice, a call for um, uh, elections for this Capri board. Um, we got this after the publication of the agenda and it is due before the end of September. So the good part is they actually don't require a board action nomination. They simply require a letter of interest. So I've been on the board six years and if this board's fine, I'd be willing to throw my hat in the ring for the next six or uh, the next four years to represent a large organization tier in the Capri uh, insurance pool. So just got the letter and we don't have a meeting between now and September 30th. So guys, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. You sure you don't want to mount this? I've got a lot to learn. I have learned a lot from this. Definitely appreciate the All right, we'll do, we'll go now to our director's report. How about if we start with Mr. Lang? Thank you, uh, Chair Cussworth. Um, two months to kind of cover in various activities. Uh, beginning of July, naturally, the 4th of July activities, pancake breakfast and concert and the fireworks. And then we had a special treat with the dedication of the point of view in Rancho Petrero for uh, Tex Ward. I thought that was very well done and was a really a great meaningful event. And I know uh, the wards uh, appreciated it. Um, MRCA conservancy meetings, et cetera. More with Mardi Gras ball. Um, MRCA, oh, that's different MRCA activities, conference calls and so forth. Um, and there was one uh, community member who uh, is concerned about the parking around uh, CLU in Mount Cliff. And uh, so he contacted me and wanted to meet with me and thinking, you know, the CLU pool uh, being part of CRPD. Uh, we wondered if uh, we felt the impact of that parking and after the discussion with our general manager and so forth, uh, it, our pool really, really doesn't impact that parking at all, but uh, he wanted to see how we felt about it. So I met with him a couple times and that's about it. Just uh, keeping up with our community activities. Director Hutter. Yeah, just a comment on the parking, George. You might have him talk to the owner of the apartment building because I'm pretty sure what happened was they're now requiring permitted parking in that in that apartment building and probably just one per family. So everyone who lives in the apartment building is now parking on Mount Cliff. Okay. So um, since our last meeting, July 21st, not a whole lot. Uh, George already mentioned the Mardi Gras ball, which was a lot of fun. Susan, you, you didn't get out there and dance, though. I usually 
It's usually you and Ed love to, to dance. To yeah, the they, they had too much talking from at the beginning. <laughs> no, seriously, you know, yeah. it just it just went on and on and on. And <laughs> you eat your dessert and you say, okay, well. <laughs> so anyway, we, a bunch of us were at the Mardi Gras Ball, which is always fun. Attended a couple of the, the last two uh, pickleball neighborhood meetings at, at Triunfo, um, which interesting feedback, positive and negative on, on pickleball. Um, Mardi Gras ball, yeah, 23rd. I didn't put that on my little list. Yeah, well, you can add it now. <laughs> yeah, well, that was a heavy month anyway. Mm -hmm. Had had our had my August meeting with with Jim and we solved all the problems of the world <laughs> and the always fascinating finance committee meeting with Susan. So okay, thank you, uh, Director Holt. Well, okay, looking back at July, July got really heavy um, because we had two concerts in the park and um, and then um, uh, you know. We had, um, I, we went to city council and um, uh, I was a speaker there. And then um, community conscience, um, I was the rep at one of their, their meetings. And um, of course went to Tex Ward ceremony and went to a pickleball meeting. So it, it was a, a very busy month. August was kind of slow. <laughs> so, um, but we met with Jim, you know, we got to meet with Jim in, in August. And of course the, um, uh, the uh, uh, concerts in the park, uh, concert in the park. And then the, I did go to the candidates meeting to see who was running uh, for um, the vacant seat <laughs> that's going to be up and of course we had a finance committee meeting so it's it's busy enough but july wow <laughs> director nichols thank you uh in addition to the concerts and balls and meetings with the general public yeah i'm going to put uh august 31st and september 1st we have a California Association of Western Park District Board meeting in Roseville for the meeting, and then we went to the Paradise for a site visit in the Park District just up there. So that was very interesting. So they had the, the campfire, which started the same day as the World Fire. Uh, they suffered a significant loss. Their community was a population of 26,000 after the fire was 2,000. And now they're up to about 6,000. So it was all uh, good. I had not been to Paradise for the most of my year. So my vision of it was kind of like uh, okay, now the Lake Arrow. That's where the open area was, you know, and the fire was just uh, closing in on them. And so that was part of what they uh, kind of played up a little bit. But then even now, 
with you know, the limited facilities that they do have and using it to kind of help rebuild their community because of all the trauma that they're going through. So they're getting outdoors, they're having some of these activities of uh, trying to restore people's faith in the community and also in the surroundings around them, but, uh, especially like the high schoolers and some of those that were youth. Their, their memory now of paradise is someplace that burned. Uh, so we're trying to reinvigorate that. So very interesting. Uh, it's a very sobering, but also very encouraging in what they're able to do with what they have. It's a very enthusiastic group of people. I have to, I have to say, that having gone through that, I mean, what a great group of people there. You can see how you know, how they can kind of hold that community together, and they're gradually trickling back into that community. So very uh, eye-opening experience. Uh, you know, I learned a lot from it, uh, not what I was expecting to learn, uh, but it was a fascinating to hear from them, and like I said, very, very encouraging to go through that process. Uh, then this morning, I had a legislative committee meeting with the, with, with the organization as well. Not a whole lot there to report, only it was more of a wrap-up because the session has, has ended, and of all the bills that were going to be passing. And a lot of times the purpose of this organization is you know, determining what needs to be supported, what needs to be opposed. That session is over with, so now it's kind of a, a kind of a rally the troops, let's get ready for the next go round. And by the way, knock on the doors of those legislators that are trying to get reelected because now is the time when they open their ears. Uh, after after the election's over, then they close their ears again. Uh, so if you know anybody who's in that position, It'll be a good chance to uh, talk with them and kind of lean on them about the needs of the park district, for example. Uh, so that was, you know, if they like to go, one last thing I'll say as a kind of a wrap up to that is what we consider community centers, the state considers cooling centers and emergency shelters, shelters, and they, it's really kind of big metaphorical here, but the idea is that they just exist and the state doesn't need to do anything for them. They just you know, whoever has them just kind of maintains them. And then when the emergencies come, they say, oh, well, you know, we've got to open that up. There's not always a whole lot of support to, to make that happen. And so, you know, I think we do get some support. We just had a cool hazard mitigation talk this evening. And I think we have had several uh, agreements that we've had recently in the last couple of years with uh, Red Cross and Fair County, City of uh, Thousand Oaks. Where we do get that camaraderie, we do get that support, but generally across the board, there's not a whole lot of support for rec and park districts to maintain those facilities in such a way so they are available when the time comes. And so I think that's going to be something that the uh, organization as a whole is pushing forward. The term they're using is resiliency centers, which they feel you know, they're always available, you know, can always be used. And we have the funding to be able to support that, whether it's an emergency or just day of the operation. So uh, that might be a trend that we see moving forward when that legislative budget on behalf of that organization. With that, I'll give it. Uh, well, I don't think I have been to any different things to do with it. I did have a very sober month yesterday. I see why we should all be here. My way of springtime. Oh, <laughs> congratulations. So, oh. Here is the future. Oh. 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 I guess we don't get to see it. <laughs> no, she'll come around. Yeah, she's only a few hours old. Yeah, we, we rushed to the hospital. I thought it was. So I thought, well, you know, sweet, yeah, how sweet. We still, we still have a, a future being born again. Uh, her name is Mel Rose. Her, her, um, I'm just going to find a different name. Her, my daughter-in-law's father's name is Mel Rose, and he goes by Enzo. And my daughter-in-law's middle name is Rose. Uh, and they decided to bring back the name because he was a known. Uh, so, anyway, so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, 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 so
There's got to be some parts of it. Okay, do we have any uh, requests for? Oh, I'm sorry. Of course. Yes, Director <laughs> Lane. <laughs> Actually, it's a question for um, Director Nichols based on his report and experience up at um, Port, um, not Port, um, Paradise. Um, you, you said the park district with the open parks and so forth was an area that the community kind of went to to get away from the fires. Um, do they have any um, rec centers and so forth uh, that made it through the, the fires. Yeah, their their main rec center and headquarters survived the fire. Okay. And their basically their parks all survived the fires. Okay, so if I understand, it's not an incorporated city, correct? Correct. And so the park district kind of has become the, I don't know if it was before, but it now obviously become the uh, center of uh, community and so forth. What are some of the programs that they're that they may have shared with you that they're having there? Forest bathing. <laughs> what? Yes, they have a forest bathing program. Hmm. It's a cooperative program. They actually have a certified. Uh, I, I, I think Dan was even said he was certified, but they had a, a young lady from. Cal State Chico come and lead us through a forest bathing exercise. Uh, and that's one of their routines. And it's part of, you know, kind of understanding your surroundings and relaxing and getting people comfortable with that area. And again, because of the trauma that they went through, mm -hmm. it's trying to kind of move past that. So that's one of theirs, kind of a healing process. It doesn't always have to be that way, but that's how they're using it. And then another uh program that they have is they bus kids in from wherever they want to come from. It's a pay to play program that they have up there to their gazebo. I can't remember what they, what they called the gazebo, but it's this beautiful area and it overlooks the, the Canyon and the bluff down below. I mean, it's just a phenomenal, which is turning into a wedding venue site. Now it's just, it's just phenomenal up there. Uh, but they said, well, that's one of the pros of the fire because it burned all the trees and they couldn't even see that site before the fire. Now they've got this beautiful site. It's like, wow, we never knew that was available to us any before. Mm -hmm. So that type of thing, they're bringing the kids there. And they, I mean, the, again, the, the, the gentleman that was leading us through that talk about energy. I mean, this guy was just off the wall um, and just leading through He kind of led us through the exercise that they would lead through the, the, the middle school kids. And, and I'm thinking, wow. So they bring, bring kids up there. It's not just for paradise because there's only 2,000 people living in paradise. They bring them up from Chico and everywhere else. Um, so it's just interesting how they're trying to use what they have with its, in their burned out condition. And yet, it, like I said, to me, it a, this is great. It looks, it looks wonderful. You know, yeah. what, what, what are you complaining about almost? I say kind of tongue in cheek. Uh, but that's the type of thing they're doing is kind of like that healing process for a lot of the youth. Thank you very much. That's kind of thinking. You know, that's uh, an opportunity, uh, you know, unfortunate after a fire like that, but it's an opportunity for the park district to become even more influential and mm -hmm. as the focal point of the community right. rebuilding. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doug and, sure. and Jim, who attended. It sounds like it's very uh, beneficial. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, thank you. I'm glad you made that comment. That was very interesting to know. Yeah. Um, do we have any items from the public? Madam Chair? No. We'll go back to item 12. Oh, so I thought we did that. Um, so requests for status reports and items for subsequent agendas. Do you have something? Yes, ma'am. I, I believe so, I'll, but I'll leave that up to the board to decide. Uh, as I was reviewing this pa packet, I noticed in our warrants, that there was a total of just over $340,000 in CalCard expenses. And while we have a very thorough itemization of the warrants and the expenses that we review, uh, to have every, everything from a CalCard expense just listed as a charge card and not knowing what was actually spent, it seemed to me to be kind of contradictory of why we are reviewing so many uh, expenses. 
So I inquired of our general manager to determine, well, what is the purpose of us reviewing these warrants every, you know, well, every month, whenever we get those? Uh, is there a requirement either by state law or is it our policy or just practice that we go through this exercise? And if so, why are we not concerned about the credit card charges, which in this case is over three hundred thousand dollars? But we're you know looking at the you know the little tokens amount that uh, you know some of our staff get reimbursed for mileage expense. It seems like there's a whole lot of money there that we have no idea how it's being spent. So I, I was just a question to our general manager is should we be reviewing that? And he was kind enough to present a whole list for me to look at, which would be it was extensive. Um, and it was more out of curiosity of why do we go through this process? And if we are supposed to be reviewing expenses, why are we not reviewing the CalCard expenses? So uh, I just kind of pose that if if the board feels likewise, it would just like to get a review of that process and what it involves. And if there's, a, um, you know, if there is a need for us to get to that point of reviewing that extra three hundred thousand dollars plus. Um, or not. So I just leave that in the, the boards for discussion or consideration as to how we move forward in the future. Um, I just have a question for Mrs. Smith. Is this unusual? I don't remember ever seeing that large of a credit card expense or even really seeing a lot of credit. And I usually look through the warrants. So this is kind of a, since we haven't had a board meeting for so long, it was over a longer period of time. So it's usually not so much. It's usually about half of that every month so that's why you're probably seeing less than that usually okay and so we usually don't get an itemized version of what's going on the credit card no is the things that are going on the credit card being approved by the general manager yeah so basically the process of cal cards is that we have the, the, the migration of the system was once the old purchase order system. Hey, I want to go buy a stapler. Well, go to accounting, get a purchase order so that you're authorized to go buy a stapler. We'll go cut a check and then you'll go to Office Depot and give them a check. So, you know, over 20 years, we started the CalCard over about 20 years ago now. So it's now become virtually every staff person has a CalCard and you have criteria on what you can buy. You have limits on a per item. You have a blackout on different categories of items. Like you can't buy liquor, you can't buy, you know, there's certain things, categories of things you can't spend. So the CalCard is designed, it's called Cal, it's, it's, it's for government and it's designed to kind of be very, um, you know, put the spending in a box. So individuals will have a per item limit and then a total monthly limit. And then the process of review is, you know, spending authority is at, you know, the, the supervisor level. So if a rec leader needs to run out and buy a new microphone for, you know, a board meeting, they, they might run down to Best Buy and say, okay, I can buy this thing for $78 and they can just buy it. But if it's maybe 200 bucks, their limit wouldn't allow them to buy it. So then they'd have to actually ask their supervisor if they could buy it. But the statements every month, everybody looks at their subordinate statements and the statements, you know, it's just like an expense report in business. You know, you, every line item of your individual CalCard goes to the supervisor and the employee is said, okay, this is exactly what I bought for this. And then they have to put the account number on it as well. So it gets put into the accounting system that way. So I can actually, I shared it with uh, Director Nichols, but I can send the whole board right after this meeting. I'll just send, it's 40 pages of, That's okay. of the CalCard expenditures, just so you can kind of get a flavor for what it is. It's also summer. So you're buying the program supplies and all the stuff that is involved in all the different camps. So you'll see all sorts of weird things that, you know, like why is government buying, you know, fishing poles or whatever it is that we're buying. So, um, yeah, so we, yeah, we could totally provide that and, um, you know. But I was, I was that. saying, and then I'll, and then I see you, Director Lane, but this is going under all the spending limits we have, because I know that we do have a very set program 
of how much can be spent by each employee, I think you're up to approving what about sixty thousand dollars without the board. So yeah, so I'm by far the largest, but it's yeah we so we have a CalCard policy and then we have our purchasing policy and they sort of meld together. So you know, and those supervisors can go up to, or I mean, I'm sorry, administrators can go up to five thousand. And then but I everything's think, available to be looked at too, right? I mean, right. I mean, it's it's all. In, well, I talked to the city about how they do it. So, like, obviously, another forty pages on top of the forty pages of the warrants that are there now, or the twenty-five, is just a lot of paper. So the city does it, where they actually have a bucket or a or a like they have a an online. I think it's online, but they give it to one board member. Who kind of signs off on it, and then the city warrants is just one line item at a city council meeting. You know, that's how much our we spent, but the all the backup is looked at and reviewed by a board member or a council member. So, so they don't, the city doesn't put in all of these pages for all of the other expenses, or is that as just far as I know, no, I I no, no not the Calcart pages, just because it is voluminous. It's just a but lot. They, do so they, does the city put in these pages? I have to like double check on the warrants okay. versus the warrants plus Calcart. I'll have to double check on that. Okay, and Director Lang. Yeah, I'm against that, and I think that's getting, you know, into micromanagement by the board. It being that staff, you know, already uh, reviews it, and there's responsibility and with spending limits and and so forth. So I'm I'm not for uh, the board to get that deep into, you know, each charge of a cal card. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, but I think the point is, and I know we went through much the same thing with the reporting on on the monthly investment report where you, you show every single investment do we really need that information no and I, I i believe the point you're making is either we should have everything or we should have just a bottom line exactly there's there's no reason to keep killing all these trees to show 47 dollars <laughs> and 20 cents reimbursement for gas expenses right because right. i yeah because right. i you know I, I i understand what what uh, director ling is saying I had a cal card at one time when I was an employee. Yes, yes and I it would had a five thousand dollar limit. It's a wonderful tool to have, and I don't mean that we shouldn't do that, nor should we do that. But my point was exactly right, Director. Uh, if if I'm reviewing that we reimbursed an employee eleven dollars and fifty seven cents for mileage, and yet I never had no idea that there was a thirty seven thousand dollar charge on a credit card. Why am I worried about the eleven dollar charge for for gas? It's just like Either we do it all or we don't. And so that's that's my point, you know, and, and then my question to the general manager is, well, are we required to do this? Or is, are we just, is it just a transparency issue that you're just providing it to us for our benefit? Or are we required to? And if there is some requirement, well, you know, can we make it more efficient? You know, and so that's really what I'm driving point. So, so thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I, I don't mean to take that tool away at all. It's just a matter of, well, do we do it all or do we do none of it or somewhere in between? You know? Or does the finance committee look at it once every now and then? I, but it is it is listed on the warrants, the Cal card? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it is there. Yeah, as yeah, a rolled up know what it's for. It's yeah, a, it's a one, like a rolled but up But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, we yeah. do it's know fair. what it's there. And I guess if well, yeah, somebody those, was interested, you could. It seemed to me that there's a lot of checks and balances here. So we know that the money is not being uh, well, used wastefully. So, so um, you know, one, one, I, I can try to, one of the things that might be useful, because I don't know how other agencies, I just call the city, but I could double check on a few other agencies, come up with some, uh, uh, you know, a sense of how different agencies approach it. And I, I haven't researched the legal sort of underpinnings of why we all do it. I, I did it because the people before me did it, the city did it. Boy, so did it. It, it, it feels though, it feels right that, you know, you guys get a chance to see what we're spending the money on. So, but I'll try to figure out what the, the if there's a you know, state law, this that says you got to do it, but I'll, I'll dig that up and then maybe look at how some others do it and maybe propose either like an all or nothing, like, okay, here's a more efficient way to give you guys the info you want. You know, maybe it is a, we still collect all the info, but we don't put 80 pages in the packet. It's provided in a different format that you guys can come here and see it, or it's a scan that, you know, you guys look at, or, you know, something, we can figure something out. Mm -hmm. I'll give you guys options. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. it's, 
you have all those individual entries, and then in the report it says $350,000 of payroll. So, I mean, you've got a big lump sum there and then all this little detail. So, yeah, if you could come to us with something that is, you know, we still get the still get some important information, but we don't need all those weeds to, to no, we don't have to yeah, I guess it's the same thing. You don't give us a whole thing oh, on how much every single person is getting paid on the payroll. You're just giving us a lump sum. But I, I can understand what Director Nichols is saying. A lot is being spent, but I think you have checks and balances mm -hmm. and we have finance committees and we have audits. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty trustful of Mrs. Smith and her accountants that it's all being done correctly. And but our employees. Yeah. yeah and Trust I, but yeah. verify. Yeah, we can give you guys yeah. info. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll and I, I think with our with our role at this level, where we are approving a budget for twenty five million dollars, you know, we have line items. You know, that's our role. You know, at that that level. But to be you know verifying that eleven dollars was spent in mileage, it seems like that's getting a little. And, and I would rather trust that staff is doing it. You know, at all levels. That as I mean, that's why we put this system in place and. I don't think we need to get to that level. So if we can, you know, make that efficient and and kind of sure. pare that down, I think that'd be a. Like I said, unless there's some requirement that the board has to do that, and that's what I'd like to know. Well, it would be interesting to know what other city um, governments are doing. You know, mm -hmm. what other city organizations are doing. So mm -hmm. okay, cool. I guess that's Thank you I'm for doing. indulging me. Okay. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, I didn't really think of it. Um, we need to adjourn this. So, items from the public. Is anybody still here? Oh, they never were. No? Okay. Um, we don't have an executive closed session. No. All right. We'd like to close the meeting um, in behalf of, in memory of Supervisor uh, Carmen Rod uh, Ramirez. Uh, following injuries she sustained uh, recently as a pedestrian as hit by a vehicle in Oxnard, she passed away. And I'd like to just read a few things about Carmen Ramirez that I didn't know. That is interesting to know, it's a very tragic death. She was a public servant in the truest sense of the term, said District One Vice Chair of the Board of Supervisors, Matt Bevere. Through her leadership and community engagement, thousands of lives were changed for the better. Carmen was an incredible champion for the people and the environment, said District to Supervisor Linda Parks. What stood out about her was her compassion, her kindness. What made her effective was her fearlessness, her clear moral compass, her intelligence, and her always volunteering to do more. She was a true public servant. She was also somewhat monumental in that she was the first Latina to be elected to the Ventura County Board of Supervisors representing District 5. That was in 2020. And before she was on the county supervisors, she proudly served on the Oxnard City Council between 2010 and 2020. Supervisor Ramirez championed social and environmental justice, government accountability, and economic vitality. So we would like to adjourn in her memory. Did anybody know her personally? If they would like to say anything. Okay. This meeting is now adjourned.